Poštovani gledalci, dobrodošli u granice Istoka. Ja sam Harun Karčić. U ovom izdanju emisije analiziramo uzroke nedavnih masovnih demonstracija u Iranu. Protesti u Iranu počeli su 28. decembra. U neredima je poginulo više od 20 ljudi, a gotovo hiljadu ih je uhapšeno. Demonstracije su se proširile na više desetaka gradova, a prerasle su u nasilje nakon napada na policijske stanice, banke i državne institucije. Nešto što je počelo kao unutrašnje nezadovoljstvo, ubrzo je poprimilo globalno interesovanje. Osim Izraela i Sjedinjenih američkih država, većina političkih lidera je veoma pažljivo komentarsala ta dešavanja. Prije nego što pređemo na analize i razgovore sa našim gostima, pogledajmo više detalja o dešavanjima u toj zemlji. Veliki broj Iranaca kaže da ni dvije i po godine nakon potpisivanja sporozuma o nuklearnoj energiji nije osjetio promjene nabolje, te da se obećanje predsjednika Hasana Rouhanija nije ispunilo. Sporozum o nuklearnoj energiji ni na koji način nije utjecao na moj život. Riža je poskupila dvostruko, meso je skuplje, stanarina je preskupa. Istovremeno djeca službenika ponašaju se kao da obični ljudi ne postoje. Novac nije završio u mome džepu ni u džepu žene koja prodaje na ulici ili kod penzionera. Ipak neki i dalje podržavaju predsjednika. Ruhani radi najbolje što može. Naravno, imamo problema, sankcije, međunarodni pritisak. Sve to utječe na život i ekonomske prilike. Ipak, ne možemo za sve kriviti predsjednika i reći da je on taj koji mora učiniti nešto. On to ne može. Moramo ga podržati, sarađivati s njim i strpiti se. Sporozum o nuklearnoj energiji dao je neke pozitivne rezultate. Nakon što su i rano podignute sankcije, ova država opet može prodavati naftu na međunarodnom tržištu. Ipak sve to u sjeni agresivne politike koju prema Iranu vodi američki predsjednik Donald Trump. Svakih nekoliko mjeseci sporozum se dovodi u pitanje. Iranska vlada troši mnogo snage na smirivanje političkog haosa, tako i da joj ne ostaje mnogo vremena da se bavi drugim pitanjima. Trump je poljuljao stabilnost nuklearnog sporozuma. Iranci vjeruju kako to nije ništa manje štetno od sankcija koje je sporozum treba okončati. Vjeruje se da strani investitori ne dolaze u Iran zbog straha, a vrijednost lokalne valute slabi iz dana u dan. Trump je čovjek s psihološkim problemom, nije uravnotežena osoba, neprestano mijenja stav. Meni kao ni većini Iranaca nije važno hoće li se Sjedinjene države povući iz sporazuma, sve dok evropske zemlje nastavljaju sarađivati s nama. Neke druge taj sporazum uopće ne zanima. Kažu kako jednostavno žive svoj život. Nastojim usrećiti ljude, to je to, ništa me drugo ne zanima. Usrećivati ljude je na neki način umjetnost, ne zanima me priča o nuklearnom sporazumu. Iranska vlada tvrdi da ima odgovor na svaki scenarij. Čini se da slično misle i građani. Da li su protesti u Iranu inicirani izvana? Počeli su u Mešhedu, konzervativnom iranskom gradu. Uzekivale su se parole protiv korupcije, nezaposlenosti, inflacije i ukidanja subvencija najsiromašnijim. Jedni tvrde da su ih organizovali krugovi bivšeg konzervativnog presničkog kandidata Ibrahima Raisija i paravojnje milice Basić kako bi se uzdrmala vlast predsjednika Hasana Ruhanija. Druga strana tvrdi da Amerika, Izrael i Saudijska Arabija stoje iza demonstracija. Kako god, stvari su izmakle kontroli. Demonstranti, uglavnom mlađe dobi, počeli su se okupljati i u drugim gradovima, a zahtjevi su od ekonomskih postali politički i ideološki. Parole su prerasle u smrt Hezbolahu, ni Gaza ni Liban, život dajem za Iran, smrt Hameneju i smrt diktatoru. Bili se to izrazi nezadovoljstva oni koji smatraju da potpisivanje nuklearnog sporozuma 2015. godine nije popravilo ekonomsku situaciju u zemlji, već samo poziciju iranskih proksija na blisko istočnim ratištima. Za razliku od zelenog pokreta 2009. godine, vlada je ovog puta blokirala društvene mreže i zato demonstranti nisu imali zajedničkog lidera niti vizije. Protesti su pretrpjeli možda i najveći udrac nakon što je predsjednik SAD-a Donald Trump počeo na Twitteru podržavati demonstrante. Slično je učinio i izraelski premijer Benjamin Netanyahu. Iranske jeltolasi su time dobili snažan argument da optuže vlastite građane da su dio imperialističke i cionističke zavjere. 
U kolektivnom sjećanju Iranaca stoji bolan ožiljak iz 1953. godine, kada su SAD i Velika Britanija režirale vojni udar i svrgnule demokratski izabranog premijera Mohameda Musadeka, a na vlast vratile prozabrnog šaha Rezu Pahlevija. Iranci su dugo sumnjali u umješanost Londona i Washingtona, ali su potvrdo dobili tek nedavno kada je CIA skinula oznake tajnosti sa dokumentata. Zato su Iranci skeptični prema svakoj zapadnoj podršci unutrašnjim demonstracijama. Idemo sada do Jerusalima gdje se nalazi Holly Douglas, iranska politička analitičarka. Holly, hello and welcome to Al Jazeera. Now, the protests seem to be dying down now, but do you think they have achieved what the conservatives wished for uh, to discredit President Rouhani and his moderate allies and eventually purge them from, from politics? Well, these protests that started on December 28th started in the holy Ma city of Mashhad, uh, and it was led by hardliners, those that are opposed to the Iran nuclear deal, Western relations, and overall just keeping to the traditions of the Islamic Republic. So when they led these protests against corruption and the economy, they didn't realize that something small like a city demonstration was going to spread all over the country. Right now that the protests have died down over the past two weeks, we see that the hardliners in a way feel that they've succeeded because of several things. For starters, President, U.S. President Donald Trump has tweeted a lot about the protests and it was their hopes that maybe he would undermine the nuclear deal, something that they're very much against. In addition, they've also been able to use these protests as examples of why the Rouhani administration hasn't been doing well. And by looking at some of the examples about corruption and the economy, they're able to cite these sources as why the Iranian people are discontent with the Rouhani government. So in a way, they have been successful, but it'll be interesting to see in the next coming weeks how the Rouhani administration responds. Mm -hmm. Now, what similarities would you draw between the latest protests and what happened uh, in 2009? Are Iranians disenchanted for the same reasons now as they were before? The 2009 post-election protests known as the Green Movement was very interesting in terms of Iranians had taken to the streets because of a fraudulent election. A lot of people were demanding that their votes be count recounted and that their reformist president, a can presidential candidate, Mir Hussein Mousavi, be elected. So th what we're seeing right now is kind of different, what, whereas the 2009 protests kind of moved, morphed into a, to, into a civil liberties movement. The protests right now are more or less about the economy, corruption, and dealing with some of the problems of the Islamic Republic itself. And having that been said, I think it's worth noting that this is a working class protest movement, whereas in 2009 this was something of a middle class and upper class movement that had leadership, which was the presidential candidates Mir Hussein Musavi, his wife Zahra Ranavard, and Mehdi Karobi, all who are now under house arrest since 2011. So while there are some similarities in terms of it being a protest movement, these are very much different things. And I think that it's going to be something that we're going to have to see in the polls in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, President Rouhani has promised to liberalize the economy, to develop small businesses, uh, and cu cut subsidies for the poor. Uh, to what extent has he succeeded? Well, since um, Rouhani's first election in 2013, Hassan Rouhani has been promising a lot of things to the average Iranian. He's very much been pushing for an austerity budget, which he's been doing. He promised an Iran nuclear deal, which he has done. And by having an Iran nuclear deal, he hoped that Western investment and the lifting of sanctions would improve the economy. And if you look at the numbers, in a way it has. The IMF declared that the economy has grown 4% this past year, and they expect it to grow even more next year. In addition, a lot of um, the inflation that the Iranians have been dealing with, in 2014 it was at 40%, now it's at 10%. These, these numbers are really showing that the economy is improving, but has it been trickling down to the masses is the real question. There's a big issue of supply and demand in Iran. Iranians. There's lots of highly educated Iranians that need jobs, but are the jobs there? And I think that with the Iran deal itself, there was this hope that once there was Western investment, there would be a lot more jobs on the market. And I think it's really balancing that with the rhetoric of the Trump administration himself. And I think a lot of the European countries are very hesitant to invest in Iran right now because of this possibility of the undermining of the nuclear deal. So. It, it, Rouhani has been doing his best, but I think he, at the same time, he still has a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned President Trump's tweets earlier. Uh, President Trump's tweets ostensibly supporting the demonstrations seem to have provi provided ammunition for conservatives to 
crack down on protesters and distract attention from the real problems that led to the uprising. Uh, would President Trump have done a better job if he kept quiet? Well, historically, the U.S. government has a history of meddling in Iranian affairs. And the reason that we never heard from President Barack Obama in 2009 during the Green Movement was because he was very much aware of that. And he knew that by speaking out and defending these protesters or saying that the U.S. supported them, that they'd be labeled as foreign agents. And it would actually hurt them more than help them. And right now, with Trump's tweets that we've been seeing that they haven't been very helpful to the Iranian protesters. They're being labeled as foreign agents, and they're being used as examples of why these protests are not very legitimate. And at the same time, I think it's worth noting that while the U.S. is in a position to voice its concerns about other countries around the world as a leader, at the same time, the Trump administration's um, support of these protesters has been um, disingenuous. And I say this because he's banned Iranians from entering the United States. These same Iranians that he say are, are living under a life of tyranny. And at the same time, here he's saying he supports the Iranians' protesters, but then you have Iranians that are unable to access Iranian apps on Google and Apple stores. Irani the average Iranians can't access PayPal, Adobe, Amazon services. So if, if you're very much in favor of helping the Iranian people, maybe show that by allowing Iranians to enter the United States, by allowing Iranians to access Western online services. And we really haven't been seeing that much from the Trump administration thus far. And how would you comment Israel's and Saudi Arabia's support for the demonstrations? Well, the Iranian people themselves are very much well aware of the hypocrisy in the Middle East. They know mm -hmm. that Saudi Arabia isn't very genuine about its su support of Iranians' protesters, and at the same time, the same with Israel. I think for some Iranians, they look at why is Israel speaking out when they're having their own austerity protests right now against the Netanyahu government and against the corruption itself. At the same time, they look at the treatment of the Palestinians and they're looking at that saying, well, maybe you should focus at your own problems before focusing on us. In the same case with Saudi Arabia and, and its handling of Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, Holly Douglas, thank you so much for speaking to Al Jazeera. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Poštovani gledalci, bila je to Holly Dagres, iranska politička analitičarka iz Jerusalema. A iranska ekonomija pokazuje znakove oporavka nakon ukidanja sankcija krajem 2015. godine. Pogledajmo i neke statistike. Novinar Guardiana i stručnjak za Bliski istok Martin Čulov uključenan se iz Ankare. Martin, great to have you on Al Jazeera. Now, the slogan, uh, not Gaza, not Lebanon, I give my life for Iran, was often heard during recent protests in Iran. Many Iranians seem to be fed up with their government's generous support for the Assad regime, for Shia militias in Iraq, for Hezbollah, Hamas, and Yemeni Houthis. Uh, do we know roughly how much money Tehran all allocates annually for its proxies in the region? That figure is clearly closely guarded. However, the, the conservative estimates of Iran's commitment in Syria alone over the last five years are in the vicinity of $15 billion dollars in terms of uh, military uh, commitment, in terms of uh, uh, capital uh, provisions, in terms of straight up donations of money to the Syrian regime in order to continue to prop up uh, Bashar al-Assad and take that into Iraq, where the commitment on behalf of the Iranian regime has gone on for far longer we're looking at many tens of billions of dollars more uh, to, to further what amounts to, uh, amounts to a full strategic investment in Iranian presence in the Sunni Arab world. Mm -hmm. Now, you have previously argued that Iran wants to establish a land corridor to the Mediterranean Sea. Why is it important for Iran to have access to the Mediterranean in addition to controlling the Straits of Hormuz and to quite a large extent the Bab el-Mandeb? Well, several reasons. Uh, it's, a, it's an arc of strategic influence right through the heartland of Iraq and Syria to the Mediterranean coast. 
What that will allow them to do is to set up a supply line to move men, resources, money, weapons, whatever they want, whenever they want, uh, without the, uh, the scrutiny that uh, goes into moving things around uh, um, through airports and, uh, and through ports themselves. Now, the Iranians have seen a, a number of their weapon supplies being interdicted by the Israelis in and around Damascus. It's much more, uh, much, much easier, I should say, to disguise uh, weapon supplies uh, in, in trucks, which are transported along corridors that are physically secured on both sides of the road, where you have loyal population groups who are going to further your cause. So being able to access the Mediterranean coast is, uh, is a twofold benefit. First of all, it does give a second marine port, as you mentioned, but uh, primarily it is a, it, about freedom of movement for everything that Iran wants to move right through the heartlands of two countries vis-a-vis uh, uh, Lebanon and also the Mediterranean coast itself. Mm -hmm. Now, you have traveled extensively throughout Syria, Iraq and Lebanon. Uh, to what extent really is Iran present in these countries? Well, Iran has military and political uh, almost dominance in Iraq. Uh, not quite. I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a ongoing uh, Najaf Kof, uh, ten, uh, uh, I should say Najaf Kom tension, which has been prevailing uh, for the last 15 years, which has reached a pretty acute phase at the moment where uh, the, the, the right to define uh, what form of uh, Shia Islamism is pursued is being very bitterly contested. But in Iraq and all levels of, uh, of the national politics, Iran has a significant presence. Throughout the Hashd al-Shabi, which is the, uh, the Shia-dominated militia groups that have done so well against ISIS over the last three years, Iran also has a guiding, if not defining role. In Syria, uh, it's, it's no stretch to say that the, uh, the uh, survival of the Assad regime is due in, in large part to the Iranian presence on ground. And as we see this uh, attack in Idlib province, uh, which has been going on for the past few days, that is being heavily directed by Iranian militias who are approaching from southern Aleppo. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the Iranian regime has patronized Shia parties and militias in a fashion that, that resembles Moscow's strategy towards uh, third world communist co movements during the Cold War. Uh, is Shia empowerment the guiding principle of Tehran's Middle East policy? I think vis-a-vis -vis the Revolutionary Guards, and in particular the Quds Force, which is the unit responsible for exporting the values of the Shia Islamic Revolution, I think that's probably right. Uh, what they are good at is building services, building capacity, uh, bringing communities with them, uh, de uh, deliverable outcomes in terms of uh, in improving the life of their own uh, of Shia populations, but also other populations who are loyal to them. It is a strategic project to project Iranian influence into the Arab world, and they have been very effective at it. Um, less so, their, their, their main rival for regional power and influence, Saudi Arabia, who has none of the, uh, the assets uh, at its disposal. Uh, it, all it has is billions of dollars, which it's attempted to use to lease people uh, over decades. And uh, I think the reaction of the Saudis in, in recent months to uh, to the, the state of the region has shown that they believe that their strategy, for want of a better word, hasn't worked, whereas Iran's strategic patience has been very successful in giving it such an ascendancy in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Now, ever since the toppling of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein in Iraq, I've been under the impression that the U.S. has in fact done Iran a favor by removing two stringently Sunni neighboring regimes. Uh, would you agree to that? Well, it's hard to argue against that in Iraq in particular, where Saddam Hussein, uh, who did control the minority Sunni sect in Iraq, and the, the Shias have long been the majority there, he was the bulwark for the Sunni Arab world, certainly Sunni Iraqis, but uh, it could be argued uh, broader than that, beyond that, uh, a bulwark against the Iranians. When he was removed, uh, a key Sunni patron was, was taken out of the picture. It didn't take Iran long to, to, to jump into that vacuum, and it spent the years since uh, establishing and reinforcing its presence in Iraq and in the Syrian war, uh, using uh, the vacuum there to, to expand its influence further to the West. And so one of the things I often hear from, uh, from Sunnis in Iraq and Syria is how could the Americans not have known that they, if they took Saddam away, that Iran would be the, the ultimate victor here. And it's very difficult to convince them that this was not necessarily by design. It was a, a potentially a lack of foresight and a lack of understanding for how the region works.
Izrael, Amerika i Saudijska Arabija su otvoreno podržali demonstracije u Iranu, nazivajući to čežnjom iranskog naroda za slobodom. Zanimljivo je da se Evropska unija ponovno distancirala od Trumpa u vezi sa pitanjem Bliskog istoka, pa je tako francuski predsjednik Emmanuel Macron poručio da svaka promjena u Iranu treba doći iznutra i da retorika Izraela i SAD-a može dovesti do rata. Vrhovni lider Irana, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, je poslovično okrivio vanjske neprijatelje za nerede, a predsjednik države Hasan Rouhani, reformista, priznao je da treba saslušati i one koji, osim ekonomskih, imaju i druge žalbe. Bilo je to sve u ovom izdanju Granica Istoka. Cijelu emisiju možete gledati na našem web portalu balkans.aljazira.net. Hvala na pažnji.